think I was like most middle class white women that had absolutely no experience with prison, never met anybody who'd been to prison, read the headlines, and I was I was like, yeah, well, that's what happens. But I had no idea who I would meet there. Hello, welcome. I'm Ben Boyce, and today I have a conversation with fellow prison educator and author Anne Bracken. Anne taught classes inside a Maryland prison that led to a poetry book called Once You're Inside, Poems Exploring Incarceration. We start there, but we also go on to discuss her second book called Crash, a memoir of overmedication and recovery. Both books are available online. Anne was overprescribed all sorts of psych meds that didn't work to treat her condition, but she took them as prescribed until she crashed her car not once, but twice in the course of a couple weeks. We cover a ton of ground in this episode, from prison poetry and education, to doctor-client relationships and our cultural issues with overprescribing, and we also hit on spirituality and non-scientific treatments, which, if you've listened to the show before, you probably already know I had a few thoughts on. So I hope you enjoy Anne Bracken. Hi, Ben. Hi, how are you? Fine, nice to meet you. Yeah, you too. Do you want to start though with just an introduction of who you are and what got you into writing about the thing or the things that you write about? Well, I, I got into writing about prison because in uh, 2015, the editor of a journal that I write for asked me if I would interview another professor who was teaching at a prison in Maryland. And I said, sure, I'll go interview her. And it was fascinating. And she said to me, you know, I've been doing this for six years, and there's absolutely nobody I'd rather talk to than those guys in the prison. And I said, oh, well, that's pretty interesting, you know, because I think I was like most Middle class white women that had absolutely no experience with prison, never met anybody who'd been to prison, read the headlines, and I was I was like, Yeah, well, that's what happens. But I had no idea who I would meet there. So after I interviewed, I'll just call her Professor M, after I interviewed her and the interview was published, my editor said to me, Now I want you to go into the prison. <laughs> I was like, What? Yeah. But I got cleared. It took about a month to get me cleared. And um, right, (laughs) probably. And, you know, they told me you have 90 minutes, you have to interview the men, and then we're going to publish your interview. But you can't take any recording devices. All you can take is a paper and pencil. So I thought, okay, what I'm going to ask them is who were you before you came to prison? And who are you now? And that was, that just opened up the doors and they were more than willing to talk to me. And I feel be extremely honest and vulnerable in what they had to say. And maybe it was because I was with Professor M and they already trusted her, but I felt like they just trusted me right from the beginning, which was to me a gift. I, you know, I always pretty much go under the assumption that you have to earn somebody's trust. But it didn't seem to get, there were a couple people that were like that. But I spent a lot of years teaching in um, a special ed program in high schools and also in a psychiatric hospital. And so I had worked with a lot of disaffected young men. And well said, because yeah, there's a line that runs from one to the other, and we sometimes call it the school to prison pipeline. I think yes. that's the term you even referred to in the introduction, but yes. it's bigger than just a simple description of that. And when you are immersed in those different spaces, you do start to realize the same institutional norms that eventually create the school to prison pipeline or at work long before it ever picks up a lot of people. And they're, they're, it's the way people are treated outside the norm. Society is not built for you. And often those spaces, I mean, I totally agree with you. You get in there and you realize really thirsty people. It's like showing up with a bucket of water and you're in the middle of a, a burning man on a 120 degree day. Everybody's really thirsty all of a sudden. And Absolutely. of course, it's a space of vouching. So I'm sure that had something to do with the ease you had of, of getting their, their trust, I guess, for lack of a better term, you were there with somebody, but often 
we come in there and we're treated just like we are as teachers that, yes. that weird clout we get and people just yeah. sort of respect you in a weird way it always still strikes me as odd you get that a lot more when you're in prison i think so and what what i would say to everybody people would say to me well aren't they trying to run a game on you and i'd say no Nobody's running a game on me. What for? What am I going to do? Bring them sticky notes? I mean, there's not a whole lot I can give them (laughs) except time. So when I, you know, they they all wanted to write. They were already writing with Professor M. So she had she had done some playwriting with them, and some of the men were interested in fiction, and a lot of them were interested in poetry. So they were also interested in history. So I would find poems that had uh, historical context and take them into the prison and have discussions about the poem on a couple of levels, like what is the history? What did you know about this? And then, you know, what are the techniques that you think the poet is using? And what, what would you like to do with this in response? I use the term thirst, but it's a lot more specific than that. And we're finding more and more, there's this term going around corrections right now that I'm not sure if you've even heard because I had to ask my students about it, but called normalization. It's an old term, but it's Mm -hmm. sort of being picked back up from Norway and Finland and places that do prison differently of connecting people in prison to their other roles as a citizen, as a father, as a son, as a, a whatever, a mother, whatever their other roles happen to be. Because when you pull somebody out of all their other networks and stick them just in prison and say, your role is inmate, your role is to survive, and your role is to get by with less than everybody else and be a permanent second-class citizen, in Michelle Alexander's words. Of course, that's what you turn into. You lean into those identities, and there isn't very many other options there. So when your students show up, sometimes they just blandly say, we want to learn whatever you, you, you were willing to teach us, and that's great, but you do a great job of capturing the questions that you would be asked in any college classroom if you get students to open up enough to admit what they don't know. We all want to know about Shakespeare, but we all kind of feel like we're already supposed to know. We want to know about American history, but where the hell do we start, right? I don't even know how a project like that begins. I need a teacher. And it's been something I've run into. I'm three semesters in now to the same group of cats at both prisons, so different group at both, but Mm -hmm. same group for three semesters each. And it's been interesting to watch them start to open up more and more and realize I never would have known to learn about Plato's cave or the prisoner's dilemmas or these things that just, once you learn them, you get to go out and you have an identity on the yard that feels very different than what a lot of the knuckleheads in there are caught up with the game that's going on. It's the only game in town. You know, I I tried to cover a lot of topics related to prison. I tried to cover the um, youthfulness of the offenders and how they changed over the years and and how much they regretted what they had done. I wanted to touch on prison labor. So there are a couple poems where I talk about that. The primary poem is about the uh, female firefighters in California, because that just is, people know about the fires in California and they know people are out there fighting fires for weeks, but they don't know that the people that are on the front lines are the incarcerated people. They're the ones that are exposed to the most danger and the longest hours and the absolute rock bottom pay. So we're going backwards. We're talking about the, the one that was actually published a little earlier, or are they both published this year? No, uh, Once You're Inside was 2022, and okay. because I'm releasing Crash in the fall, I put a 2023 copyright on it. Well, you're cracking the, the seal on, I already said institution, so maybe I cracked the seal, <laughs> on what would it, in some circles be just called slave labor, or yes. in Colorado, as you can imagine, we have a big firefighting incarcerated group mm-hmm. too, and The way the system is set up, it it might be one of the most insidious and obvious examples of a a system designed to put the people who are put in the worst situation in it in a position to support their own bad way to fight fires. And like you said, all the stuff that goes with that, but you're outside of the walls part of the time. The requirements say if you're in prison, you have to have a job, an assignment. Sometimes it can be school or something, but you're washing dishes. And you're getting paid for that with finger quotes that our viewers, our listeners can't see. 
are on the amount of 20, 23 bucks a month for the kitchen for spraying food down and all day long, eight, nine hours a day, putting it in or helping cook or serving meals, or you're getting out of the prison and you're making the big money. You're making 50 bucks a month to fight fires. It makes the people inside there, rightly so. I don't want to challenge these things and say they should be gone because they're all that's there right now. It gives them identity in the system set up to make them fully endorse that and love that they crawled their way to the factory in the back where they make an extra four bucks because they need a cream for their feet or something that they can't get in prison. It's perhaps the most obvious example of how the system doesn't have a lot of room to reshape itself without some real systemic overhaul. Absolutely. And prison labor is largely hidden in this country. And I think for obvious reasons, because so many, we, we all benefit from it to one extent or another. In Maryland, the people in the prison where I worked make all the furniture for the public schools and the public universities and community colleges and the state office buildings. Mm. So when I found that out, I thought it was particularly egregious that the University of Maryland's brand new education building had been furnished by people who are being denied an education. This is- they had done all the work to build the furniture, make the bookcases, and they were being denied an education. We were in a similar situation here where our university was also in bed with prison industries and all the desks that we were teaching on and the chairs and the, even some of the electronic equipment. If you've never been on Unicor.com and you're listening, take a few minutes to just scroll oh, yes. through all this. You will not believe how many items you can buy on there if, here's the big if, because it's not slave labor because the law says you have to either be a nonprofit organization or a government organization. Notice too, if you look close, the prices are bananas. So our university had long exclusivity deals to buy almost all of their stuff from DOC. So now I'm teaching in the prison and that had a big part of this whole program coming to be. The university was called to task and the students and people that were involved even in the university, the bureaucracy of sorts said, you're right, we won't do it anymore is not enough. You've been doing it for 30 years. Those people aren't entitled to education and Pell Grants are gone. How can we come up with some money to give back to them? And guess what happened? The university, by and large, got behind and got donors to fund the first two years of this program that is college education inside prisons. I'm hoping other states are doing it as well, and we just haven't heard a lot about it. But this should be the way we move forward as we start to come to reckon with these things that have been totally one-sided. It should be a pit of education. Everybody that gets out of prison should have so much damn licensing and training Mm -hmm. and skills that whatever you want from a college degree to uh, the ability to drive a truck. Why are we spending 70 grand a year to lock people up and almost be certain that they're ready to go back when they get out as opposed to ready to get into the, sorry, I'm preaching to you, you know all this. Yes, I do. And I just would add that they also don't have a place to live often when they come out. And Maryland had the box on the job application and that there was a big ban the box initiative and they banned the box, but they only banned it when you're getting interviewed. And then apparently they can ask you later. This is the, the funny thing about ban the box is that we waited This country is so good at like virtue signaling and doing stuff that obviously it's too late to make a difference. We waited till the internet is in full force. And now it takes 12 bucks to do like an extensive background check on somebody in four minutes. Most people are like, fine, ban the box. If you really want to know, you've got their name and their birthday. Right. That's that's the unfortunate part of it is like what we typically do with problems. Brush them under the rug and make it look like you fixed it. And anybody that's looking close would say, I think it actually got worse. Because before you could at least say, I told him I was convicted of a felony and they wouldn't even interview me. And now, hey, there was no box on there. We did not interview you because of a felony, wink, wink. We just paid 12 bucks to weed you out and you have no idea that's why we're doing it now. Right. So before we move into your your bigger book, I'm trying to think of some specific examples that are probably worth touching on. Maybe the Elevator X or the the that was in the basement. Do you want to talk a little about either of those? Yes. The... um... So when I first got there, you go through one building and you get checked very cursorily and then you walk, you get let out of that building and then you walk across a big open yard and you enter another building and you walk down a hallway and the gates open 
and then you step into a space and the gates close and then you get on the elevator. And my, when the door opened, I could see a big yellow X on the floor. And my friend said, whatever you do, don't step on the yellow X. And I said, why? And she said, because that'll make the elevator stall and they just haven't fixed it. Now, I worked there for three years and they never fixed it. And people would crowd. I would be there at shift change. So the corrections officers would be packing onto the elevator. Nobody ever stood on the X, but they Mm. never fixed it. You know, they just left it there. And to me, that was emblematic of the atmosphere in the prison. I, I was completely shocked at how dirty it was, how bad it smelled, and how old everything was. Because all you ever hear as an outside person is how much it costs and what a waste it is, and we're spending all this money on prisons. And everybody I asked, and it was particularly the chaplain, because he was the only person who would help us get into the prison. He would say, I don't know where the money goes. It's not going to me. (laughs) Yeah. And you hit on this with the, there was a flood you talked about where yes. who knows if somebody was just talking off the cusp, but it sounded like somebody that had been in a meeting heard that the reason it wasn't getting fixed is because the building's old enough or retrofitted or whatever it was that it was a hundred thousand dollar fix just for a leak yes. pipe. This is every prison and jail I've been to, even the new ones within a few years start to have problems that they're built in mass. There's mm-hmm. 600 or 6,000 cells in each one. That means if a, a valve goes bad in a cell, you can be pretty sure all the valves are going to vent or the, yes. the doors actually in Jackson, Michigan, where I spent time, the cell block was eventually condemned and people had the incarcerated people moved out because the doors would jam up. So they were playing a game of moving us around for a while every time the fire marshal would shut down a cell block. But that sort of stuff just happens. And what are we going to do? We can't, we built these prisons on a permanently forward looking perspective. You don't see, aside from like a a fake lag in the last two and a half years because of COVID that's immediately rebooming right now, where we weren't really locking people up as fast and for as long, you don't see prison populations go through the floor historically. It's become this big industry that unless, I keep hitting at institutions, but unless we rethink some systemic institutional goals and ideas and how we pay a whole lot of hard working law-abiding, tax-paying, pride-worthy career citizens that are working in criminal corrections that stand to lose their careers. If we ever empty out our prisons like we pretend we would want to, we kind of can't. We have a whole industrial complex out there of probation officers and judges and prosecutors and all the good people, quote, in our culture that we look up to that they don't have the ability to see things the other way because they will be broke. They won't have a home. Right. I'm one of these people that has hope, that has hope that things can change, you know, which is why I wrote the book. I believe in the power of poetry because it touches the heart. You can read Michelle Alexander's book and get outraged. You could read the Attica book and, you know, feel devastated at what happened at Attica 50 years ago, but it might not touch your heart as much as personal stories in a poetry book. And that was my hope that if I could read these poems to an audience and let them feel something, that they would be more open to the, to even considering something different. And now it's funny because I find myself, uh, my daughter just got engaged and the larger extended family has two judges, part of the family, and they're in yeah. Baltimore City which uh, I don't know if much news reaches you out there in Colorado, but Baltimore is a pretty lawless, corrupt place, unfortunately. And these two men are doing their best as judges to be fair to people. So it's very interesting to talk to them and to get another viewpoint about the criminal justice system. Um, Isn't it? One of my early episodes, I got a hold of one of the judges that sentenced me early on and got him to come on the show. And he's retired now. But I think what you're saying is the same thing I ran into. He was more than cognizant and willing, especially now that he's retired, to say, we've got some real problems. And it's been that way for a while. And I was one gear in a machine doing my best to, if you really resist too much, and you just start letting people go, you're not going to be a judge for very long. If you 
start treating people different than every other CEO around you, you're not going to be a CEO very long. They're going to move you to the front. How do we rethink that system? That's funny that you have them in your circle as well, because I don't know why it was so surprising to me, but I think I was expecting something more along the lines of it's bad, but it's not that bad. And it seemed like almost the people on the inside have, have a better perspective sometimes of how on the wrong track we might be in some ways. I think so. I've I've only had a couple conversations, but he's open to talking to me and I'm learning from him. So yeah. I think it's important to have the dialogue. You know, he's it's not his fault that prisons are the way that they are. Just like you said, he's a cog and part of a machine. But the way that I look at social change is that it takes a lot of different pressure points to get things to change. So if there is a judge who maybe advocates for drug court instead of locking people up and has a good way to to help people get off of drugs and supervise them and provide them with support that they most likely need and get them into a community, you know, that can be a pressure point for change. Okay. Writing a poetry book can be a pressure point for change. Yeah, I get called a cynic a lot, and it's I, I'm not like hopeless for society or for humans. I just see, I guess, the long road that it would take to even walk through a few of the things we've talked about today. Um, we can come back to firefighters again, because I think that's a good example of this, too, where the best solution you offered was expungement, which in a way is to say you're one of the good ones. Let's get you out of this group of bad guys. And now everybody feels even better about discluding felons. Same thing with drugs. We live in a world where that is the deciding factor for a lot of parolees that go back only because they fail a drug test. And it's seen as synonymous with success. And of course, we all, especially if somebody's getting back on their feet, the last thing you want to do is steer a parolee into like, hey, go get on heroin daily again. But if somebody's using heroin daily to the point that it's destabilizing, something's going on. And if they're to that point, why in the, like, where did we get it in our minds a hundred years ago? One thing that's on the short list of what we should do is make their life worse. Let's put them back in prison because that'll help. It increases relapse, increases the likelihood of overdose. Again, we're at this point, we're like, well, then what's the solution? And it kind of sucks that the solution is lean more into another arm of the system that's expanded and blown up over the last 20 years, the drug courts and the rehab industrial complex. Because those institutions haven't yet evolved to really accept what I'm saying. We still look at addiction as a disease. We still right. see, we're turning the corner into your other book, I think, so we can pretend I did this on purpose. Okay. We still see SSRIs and drug, all drugs for that matter, because this is what your book is about, as one size fits all, as let's just look at what they do in the brain and body and make some generalizations about what people do or feel when they're on them and be done with it. And when we see right. things that don't align with it or dangers or good things that aren't supposed to be there, because I thought this was a bad drug, those stories are gone. I get I'm the exception is what people would say, but I'm still a drug user. And there's a long time that I knew that was something that would ruin my life. And it's a weird thing, ironic in an awful way, that coming to the conclusion that I didn't need to keep fighting it out in a 12-step program Mm -hmm. and that I could responsibly use certain drugs at certain times was actually my doorway out. But it only happened after I was off parole because I I would have been in prison if I was smoking weed back then, which is just one of many. But I'm on the spectrum. And I still have teachers that I know from my PhD that are like, well, these kids use drugs. And I explain over and over. I don't think I ever went to a class. PhD, master's degree, bachelor's, go back as far as you want, teacher, where I wasn't under the influence of something. And to a lot of people, that's disqualifying. But those of us that were there, I knew to shut the hell up back then, too. So sorry, there was a lot packed into that. But we're still stuck in this system that's like, what of the people that just had a bad day and did some cocaine and need to be hugged and given another identity and given alternative tools, they're put back in the cell. Right. And I find it supremely ironic that we will so easily give children stimulant drugs at the drop of a hat and we we label them with a fake disease, which usually is the result of something in their background that doesn't allow them to attend to things the way that other people might be attending. And we'll we'll give them drugs. And yet we know the negative aspects. But I think you brought it up in your book that Is it methamphetamine that's the same as Adderall? 
in the brain, they do the same right. thing. Yeah. Right. And so, you know, nobody would, <laughs> nobody would give their kid meth, but they're very willingly give them Adderall to take to the school nurse. So yeah. I don't think we're, you know, I was a special ed teacher for a long time and I never knew anything about stimulant drugs, except that if a kid couldn't sit still, that that's what we recommended to the parents. And we had no other paradigm. It wasn't until my own son was diagnosed, which I thought was absolutely ridiculous, but the school was threatening me. And so I went ahead with it. And then when he turned to me one day and he said, mommy, will this pill fix me? I was just really upset. And I thought, we need to find some other answer. And it turned out he was just bored. He was super bored and he was getting himself into some trouble just to make his day more interesting. I'm like, I'll meet you three quarters of the way and give credit to anybody that the conditions exist. I think we live in a culture where it's not only one size fits all, but we, you make reference to this in the book, actually, in a, in a question I actually want to pose to you. What made all these doctors think, in the consumers for that matter, think that what we just got to do is find a drug that works and whatever your ailment is, come see me. I'll look it up in my book. I'll write you a prescription. Mm-hmm. And it feels like it's everything we've been talking about, but it's worth turning that question back over to you. I'm not a specialist in stimulant drugs, but... Me me either. I actually was never a big fan of them, but I know lots of people that use them now too, but Mm -hmm. they're not one size fits all. And for people like me, they actually are incredibly distracting, but they fit Mm -hmm. the same paradigm as your SSRI. If somebody's on SSRIs and they know they're working for them then they are. Then keep yeah. do, do your thing with your doctor, but just never let anybody tell you that whatever the substance that you're thinking about taking will either do one thing to you and that's the end of the story, or it'll do something really bad to you and that's the end of the story. But we got to take both sides, I guess is what right. I'm saying. I, but man, the yeah. overprescription and not just uh, Adderall before we move on, it's Ritalin too. And Ritalin yeah. in the brain, it's actually similar to cocaine in the brain, which is mm. why when people crush it up and use it, it's so much more catching that we so often want to do it more. But even those things, it's the vast majority of people that ever struggle with addiction spontaneously recover, even in our culture mm-hmm. that's designed to make it hard for them without any treatment. And the majority of people that try any drug never even struggle with addiction. But man, those folks like me that do, I wish we could figure out from where you're talking about at the very start mm-hmm. all the way through. It's not yes or no. It's not Oh, your right. kid's got ADHD. Here's some meth. I'll see you in 10 years. Or they get nothing. It it might be a combination of both. You need to be involved in, as the mom or the dad. I fully agree. And by the time I was teaching high school and I had all these young men that were distracted in school, and what I, you know, when you dig, I was the case manager. So when you dig into the story, one boy had both parents that were such severe alcoholics that he couldn't even live with them anymore yeah. you know so so there's plenty of reason for him not to be able to pay attention he's right. probably worried about his parents and do how good do i have to be to stay with my aunt and uncle i don't want to get in trouble i need a home he was such a nice kid yeah. you know and yet he would be in the classroom tipping up his desk, pounding on the drums. And I would just go over and rub him on the shoulder. And some kids I would take for a walk when I was co-teaching. I would, if they were really distracted, I would just say, go, let's do a lap around the hallway. <laughs> I remember those teachers because I, I was spanked in a, I was actually pulled out of public school for a number of reasons, but put in a Christian private school. And one of the reasons was corporal punishment had gone away from the public schools in our area. And my parents wanted that available to them. My dad like now looks back and he cringes. And I don't think he even knew I was spanked until years later, but my mom still stands beside it because she grew up in that world and she has translated certain religious verses to mean you should hit your kids. But I think I look at that the same way where I'm like, what a weird number we did on ourselves. Has anybody ever been punched and then been like, oh, well, that fixed everything or hit in a certain way? No, of course not. But what it is is a, a shame inducing, oh, crap, everybody knows now. Maybe I'll just swallow this thing and not say anything. And this is the overprescription of amphetamine like drugs. They'll keep you busy when you need to be distracted because you're thinking about your parents. But anytime you need to be on daily doses of heroin, the warning light should say, 
what the hell is going on? And while you're medicating to that point, let's do you have a broken leg? Let's get the damn leg fixed. Do you have right. a broken heart? Let's get you some tools to work through the heart because you can't keep pouring heroin or amphetamine into a body for, again, the same reasons that your second book, the crash book, talks about. And most even doctors will talk to you about it's tolerance. We're humans. We're designed to adapt to whatever the hell you put in us or whatever experiences we encounter over and over, which means if you bump into a drug that works, you better figure out what it's working for pretty quick because your coffee isn't going to give you the same buzz in 10 years if you drink the same cup every day as it did today. You'll feel it. But if you really need the thing the drug's giving you, figure out what's at the root of it. And that kid needs to be in some sort of therapeutic environment where he's right. learning it's okay to feel this way. And yes, I mean, teachers that's like you to pat him on the head. That's where the public schools, they're, they're understaffed. Most of them have that, that I worked in in Maryland and Maryland, the counties where I worked funds their schools really well, but they would only have one psychologist in a school. Yeah. And that's an educational psychologist who tests people's academic ability to see whether or not they have a learning disability. Go, try to go to the guidance counselor. They have caseloads of 400 kids. So there isn't enough room for the, what they would call the touchy-feely stuff. But I was lucky enough to have very small classes because my kids had pretty serious learning disabilities. So I could develop more of a relationship with them. And, you know, I did learn to ignore a lot of the <laughs> very difficult behavior and find a way to get inside and kind of help them yeah. function better. But it's, it's very hard. And I, I think to get back to my, or to begin to talk about my story with Crash, I think growing up and watching my mother just take medications all the time and not ever get better for more than a couple of weeks at the absolute most. She just struggled for over 40 years. And th when I found my father's records and I discovered that when she first had a severe postpartum depression, they gave her six drugs in a six-week period. And my brother, my older brother said, you know, mom and I were talking and she was banging her head against the wall saying, I can't take it anymore. And when I found the list of drugs, I thought, well, no wonder they're giving her, uh, I think it was Ritalin, and they were giving her antidepressants that, that had speed-like effects, and they were giving her barbiturates, and she was a mess. No wonder she collapsed, and she was not a big woman, and she had four little children. So, And then the clock starts rolling, because that's right. the, one of the underlying themes through the book that you're starting at the beginning of, and we can follow through, is... You are a collection of your experiences, but in the most, I'm using the word insidious a lot today, but in, in <laughs> this really self-deceptive way where often life is about every 10 years sort of re realizing, oh no, I've been doing this thing that I just didn't realize was my normalized behavior because I grew up in an environment where that's where everyone did and I didn't quite realize that's not the way to do things. So when you feel bad, and this is the question we're centering is, what made these doctors just think, try a pill, try another pill? What makes these therapists at a school, and you kind of answered this, think, ma'am, we need you to come in. We got to talk to you. Your kid, if you want to have him back, he's got to be put on Ritalin. You're hitting it. It's because they got 400 person caseloads because we don't really care enough in this country to do it the right way because we don't really value personal relationships and mushy gushy talking about stuff because my God, what if Jimmy says what's really going on at home and CPS shows up? Nobody wants my dirty laundry aired. So if you can just like prescribe all these kids medication in a 1984 style, I'm trying to remember what the drug was they gave everybody that well, was like. I don't know about 1984, but in Brave New World, it was called Soma. Oh, th I'm glad you corrected that. Yeah, it was Brave New World, Soma. Yeah, it's the same yeah. sort of like, eh, just follow the rules, be content, right. calm down in class, punch right. the clock, read be your chapter. With, with your lot in life, just. Yeah, it sounded like an opioid, really. Yeah. That's what it sounded like to me. Yeah. But, you know, watching my mother, I can remember being a teenager and thinking, I am never going to be like that. She just, she, once I found out what drug she was taking, 
And it was just recently, within the past few years, I think my mother was remarkable. And I think she did a phenomenal job. But when I was watching as a teenager, I saw all the ways that she couldn't function as the other mothers did, the mothers of my friends. And I just made up my mind that was never going to happen to me. And then my father kind of reinforced that by saying, well, you know, you're a Bracken. Brackens are strong. That doesn't happen to Brackens. It's just your mother's side of the family that's weak. You know, he had that old kind of thinking because that's what people thought. And, you know, your grandfather struggled with depression. He lost his job. And yeah, it was the middle middle of the depression. He yeah. lost his job. I, yeah, I guess he was depressed. He had four kids. And they, <laughs> were, in, they were all in high school. I mean, who yeah. wouldn't be depressed? Right. But, yeah. um, well, and you, you weave this in really well, too, because you're, your dad's, a lot of people listening are going to be able to relate to this. His insults weren't always you know, stabby and trying out to get you, he did what a lot of us can relate to, which is he cushioned them in comedy that this sort of made me self-reflect and realize I was raised by parents that often said devastating things in a comedic tone too. And I now use comedy as sort of a a disabling device when I feel like, oh, I don't really want to say that, but I want to say that, right? Because it cushions the blow and you've always got this get out of jail free card you can deploy within four seconds. I'm just joking. And how those blows not only still land in a way that often is invisible to the blow issuer, but that 10, 20, 30, 40, 50 years later, to borrow religious terminology, they've taken root and they've grown into these entire defining characteristics of our lives that we, you have to look really close and usually get a good therapist to realize, oh, that's why I feel that way. And you did this not only with yourself, but with an example with your, uh, your first husband, if I remember, I, I, I've only think. had one. I'm very happily single. So no, I'll take that. That's good for you. <laughs> you talk about he internalized. Was it somebody repeatedly said to him, we don't get sick in our house. Yes. We don't get sick. His, and it became this parents, weapon. His parents, we, we don't get sick. We don't get yeah. sick. And so when I experienced a postpartum depression after the birth of our daughter, it was physical at first. I was having all this pelvic pain and I I went to, I even went and had exploratory surgery and the doctor said, well, there's nothing there. I'm sending you to a neurologist. And I think it had been six months of physical pain by then. And by the time I saw the neurologist and the neurologist said, you know, you're depressed, I was ready to hear it. And then I went to, I think it was my mother's psychiatrist, big mistake, but I went to my mother's doctor and he gave me Elevil, which was one of the older antidepressants. And I was home when my husband came home from a day of playing golf and drinking and probably smoking pot. And, you know, he walks in and he says, well, what did the doctor say? And I told him, I said, well, I, I'm experiencing depression and I'm going to take some medication and I'll be fine in a couple of months. I don't want a wife who has psychological problems is what he said to me. I mean, that was absolutely devastating. What do you do with that? You know, yeah. so so I immediately like got better as fast as I could and got off the yellow bill because I wasn't, I really wasn't allowed to be sick, um, especially not with depression. Hmm. I guess I still want to know the answer to the question. So before we get too far past it, how, okay. we, so we've talked makes, about it from different angles now, but what do right. you think the reason is then? Because it happened I, to your mom, it happened to you, and it turns out it happened actually farther down the road where it's like, how do you feel? Here, take this pill. And both sides of this equation seem to feel almost pre-programmed and comfortable saying, oh, okay. And often not even looking up what it is, just knowing that your doctor, the commercial told you to work, take it. Right. So with my mother, once I found my father's records of her treatment, I stopped writing the book and I started researching drugs in the 60s, particularly psychiatric treatment in the 60s. And I read a book called The Age of Anxiety by Andrea Tone, and that was about the development of Milltown and then the other drugs like Valium, Librium, those drugs, and the the culture surrounding the calm down drugs, if you want to call them that. And my mother took Milltown. That was one of the first drugs I became aware of. My father would say, oh, 
you need to calm down, go take a mill town, you know? So she'd go to the counter and take one. Then I thought, well, you know, I was a kid during the fifties and sixties, but I don't cognizantly know what the culture was because I was so young. So I, I just did a search on drug ads from the sixties and I came up with drug ads that had been in medical magazines or medical journals. And the way women were depicted was horrific. They were, you don't say. Was. I mean, they were, <laughs> they were all that. like frumpy housewives leaning on a broom and not wanting to clean the house. I mean, that's what the ads were saying. And, you know, do you want your wife to cook dinner? Give her some. Ritalin. I mean, they were giving yeah. Ritalin. That was one of the first drugs for depression was Ritalin back in the 30s. And there was one ad where, I mean, it looks like the most dark, ugly corner of a abandoned house with an old radiator and this woman practically in rags, like kneeling with her head covered. And what are they advertising? Ritalin. You know, so I got a real idea of how women were viewed. And I I found another article that was written by some doctors in the UK. And they studied, what do you call it? Insulin coma therapy and electroconvulsive therapy. And this was written, I think it was 1959. So I thought, boy, this, this is right at the time period. And it was all about attitudes of medical practitioners towards the depressed people. Yeah, it was it, well, number one, it was infuriating, but it was also heartbreaking because I found out ECT had or electroconvulsive therapy had been used as a weapon. You know, yeah. he's he's too um, pushy. Well, we're going to go shock him or her husband says she's not compliant enough. A couple shocks will take care of that. Or if you're so-called acting up on the ward shock you, you know, yeah. and it re- and the, that's how they talked about it. They had actual comments from medical people saying these things, you know, that was their attitude. They had a very mechanistic attitude and it was either pills or coma therapy or electroconvulsive therapy. Lobotomy, I tried, I didn't even want to read about because I did read a little bit about it, but I just find it so horrific that anybody could do that to another person. Yeah. So I, I kind of formed the hypothesis that this is how they saw mental illness in the 50s and 60s. They saw it in a very mechanistic way. You know, my mother was given drug after drug. I have a whole list in the back of the book of all the drugs that she was given and all the times that she had electroconvulsive therapy. And she had very little therapy. And she, of course, she was going to male psychiatrists. Hmm. So here she is. She was a pretty reticent, quiet, very proper woman in the 60s, going to these male psychiatrists. And a lot of times I remember my dad saying, well, your mom didn't say anything today. The doctor says your mom didn't talk. And I'm thinking, you know, now I look at it and think, she probably didn't know what to say. And, and, and she knew that if she did say anything, they would just tell her to take her pills and be nice to her husband. Yeah. And I, I, I'm always I'm using this terminology a lot today too, but cynically taking a long view and clearly, unless we're incredibly lucky, you and I, and live in the only time in history when the people that live 50 or hundred years from now, aren't going to look back and like hold their nose. But I see that the pharmaceutical ads nowadays, and they use it's a much more clever PR, but I'm sure they said that about Edward Bernays, who was making those original ads that we now look at and we're like, this is so problematic, not just for the se- I mean, sexism and misogyny, it's in there, but it's right. also problematic for the uh, basically anybody with a, a mental disorder of any sort or a non neuroatypical thinking pattern is an issue to be solved as rapidly as possible preferably by themselves or get the hell out of the way. And it's like Reagan moved in and sort of made that worse. But now we're right back to where your second book, <clears throat> your more recent book, the one we started with, is talking about too. We've got these massive prison systems that have come to house people that can't mm-hmm. 
follow the rules that are designed and orchestrated and enforced by those around them. I uh, It was right on time reading your book, so talk about coincidence. I went through the prison museum next to the prison I teach at. I teach at the oldest prison in Colorado. It was opened in 1897, I think, and it's the same building. It's actually kind of homely. The walls are built out of the mountain behind it, and it's actually mm. built into the mountain, so you can go at least yeah. go out in the yard and see something, right? It's for a prison anyway, it's homely. Women's prison is right next door to it. It's now a museum. And right before I read that chapter in your book about UCT that described the machine, my wife and I went down there and took a tour, which is in and of itself pretty nauseating. But I'm an author and I want to, you know, I'm teaching inside the prison. I want to go tell them what they're being represented as. And in one of the cells, they had a machine that I didn't realize what it was because the description said, this machine was often used to use electricity to discipline especially problematic inmates. And it oh, was no. yeah, an image, uh, yeah. the thing next to it had the wires actually hooked up to it. And it looked like one goes around the head and they might even had some they put on your arms or something, or maybe they were just strapped in, but I'm pretty sure it was an ECG machine. So do you want to say a little bit more about what that is and how that plays into your story? Even in yes. the, the lineage? Yes. I went to high school in Baltimore City and I had to ride the bus to school and ride the bus home. And I went through, you know, a very nice part of town where the library is and a lot of beautiful old townhomes. And my father said, I need you to meet me at the doctor's office after school. I need some help with your mother. And I said, okay. And that was it. That's all I knew. I had the address. I got off the bus. I walked to the doctor's office. I sat in the uh, waiting room and I was the only that I can remember. This is all whatever I can remember, I was the only person there. And it was kind of dark. It was like a little musty. And all of a sudden the door opens and this doctor walks out and my mother can hardly walk. And her head is bent down and it just was horrible. And my father, you know, got her to sit in a chair. And then he said, well, you have to get your mother out to the car. I'm going to go get the car. And, and I'm thinking, what the hell happened to my mother? This is awful. She just looks terrible. And we got her in the car and we drove home and nobody's telling me anything. Nobody's talking. I was 15 and uh, we got home. I had to cook dinner. Mom went to bed. And then that night after, after dinner and after cleaning up, my father called me into the kitchen which is where we always had our private talks and he locked the door and he told me about electroconvulsive therapy. And he just said, sometimes your mother needs this. It really helped her when she was in the hospital, when you were a little girl. What I found out about this doctor is that he gave ECT in his office without uh, total anesthesia. And I think he must have used a barbiturate, a short acting barbiturate, because my mother had 39 treatments. And I just know that she never would have gone there willingly if she didn't have some kind of sedative. Can you describe just briefly what it is? So it's electroconvulsive therapy. so, So what it is, it's, you know, it's still sold to people as a cure for what what they now call um, treatment-resistant depression, which is depression that doesn't respond to a medication, but the medications work for fewer than 50% of the people anyway. So plenty, and I was considered treatment-resistant. So it's a machine that they put electrodes on your head and they run a high enough current through your brain so that it provokes a grand mal seizure. When I found a description of that, which they still do in India, they call it direct ECT. The doctor who wrote about it said that you needed a team of something like 14 people because you had to hold the person down. Their, their limbs were jerking. They, their bones could break. I mean, it's, it's a really massive trauma to the brain. I think it was an Italian, uh, I think his name was Ferletti, but I'm not sure, came across it accidentally by watching pigs be slaughtered. And if they were shocked, they did not resist the slaughter. And so it's a lovely story. Wow. 
But um, uh, that's why I think this particular doctor must have used a barbiturate. And that and my mother also seemed pretty drunk. Yeah. Uh, It sounds like after you were classified treatment resistant, which is an awful, it sounds so capitalist word, like, hey, you've tried all these drugs and you're not getting better. So you're treatment resistant. Like, it wasn't me. It's just this biology, this bag of water I have to live in (laughs) that, that I am. You also did ECT. Is that right? I did because I had been trying for over two years to get out of depression and I had tried, you know, like every drug that they could throw at me and some of them twice with different doctors. I even had a doctor take my file and throw it across the room and say, I'm sending you to Hopkins. They deal with people like you all the time whatever that means. He never explained it. And I just felt like, oh, hopeless, hopeless people like me. That's who goes to Hopkins. Yeah, I do that language a lot. (laughs) When I went to Hopkins, you know, the doctor asked me, well, how did you feel when you took Ellaville? And I said, well, when it finally worked, I felt great. I felt like a party girl. And he said, how long did that last? And I said, I don't know, two or three days. And he's writing and writing. And he says, well, you have mild atypical hypomania. And you basically, you're manic. Uh, So you need mood regulators. Well, you know, that was just more drugs coming my way. And I fought his diagnosis. But once a doctor puts it in your file, there's no fighting. You know, that's who you are. You are someone with what they call bipolar two, and you have to be medicated that way. So I finally got to the point where I was taking so many drugs, four or five, that I couldn't feel anything. And I kept saying to my doctor, I can't feel anything. I don't feel anything. And the way that I describe it is like being in an old glass telephone booth. And I remember being in my kitchen and feeling this way and looking at my two kids sitting at the table and thinking, I can see life, but I can't feel any of this life, you know, and I just struggled with suicidal thoughts for years because I couldn't feel. And so finally, I decided that the only way that I was probably going to get better was to have electroconvulsive therapy. Yeah. And it too didn't work. And right. like we're, we'll, we'll fast forward to probably 25 years or so. But at this point, as we're talking, you haven't been on any SSRIs and or can't say any drugs because there's a nice interesting caveat I want to touch on, which is kava. But you haven't been on any SSRIs for 20 years. Is that right? And you haven't right. struggled with what have- we traditionally call what you were originally diagnosed the SSRIs for anyway? No, I have not struggled with any periods of depression. I do at times struggle with um, anxiety over driving. And I, I would relate that to the title of my book. I think you're alive. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, this is where I, I told you I'll, I'm going to go way off the questions anyway, but I wanted to start by saying any uh, book that starts with the description of a drug fueled accident immediately has you hooked. It's like starting your movie with a drone shot of a prison wall. And all of a sudden the viewers are like, what? Ooh, I'll give this 20 minutes. The whole book was a roller coaster ride through all the stuff we've been talking about. I've said repeatedly that if you're at a point where you need something for whatever reason, it makes sense as an evolutionarily evolved creature to steer towards chemicals or substances that have been in a relationship with us as humans for a long time. And you mentioned kava, which oddly has taken huge doses of kratom during COVID, uh, like 30 grams a day. And I got off kratom three, four months ago now. And for, through part of that detox, I t- took some kava and I didn't really enjoy it. It felt, t- I, I noticed it. It was uh, similar to like a benzodiazepine, but it was really short lived and it felt set in setting. My setting was like, yeah, but I want more energy and I want it to last longer. And it's not Kratom, right? It's not my substance of choice. But why did you start taking kava and do you still take it? Um, I started taking kava because they were the doctors were giving me Valium for anxiety. And now that I know what effects some of my antidepressants can cause, I think that a good deal of the anxiety was because of the antidepressants. But I can remember waking up in the morning and feeling like I was going to throw up and just having this, you know, chill through my body, like I couldn't stand being there. And I just would roll, literally roll out of bed and go take a Valium. 
But then the Valium would wear off just a few hours later, and I would feel like my throat was seizing up. And somehow I came across Kava Kava, which everybody says, oh, no, you can't take that with Valium. And I remember thinking, hell, I'm taking so many drugs. You're going to tell me that this herb is going to be bad for me. What it did was that it leveled out the anxiety. It just, you know, so then I didn't have to take much Valium at all. I would take maybe one pill a day and then just use the Kava Kava and it leveled everything out. Now I, um, well, I want to talk about the car crash because I think that's significant. And then I can talk about Kava Kava in relation to my life now. So by 2000, I was on eight or nine drugs and I was on four psychiatric medications and about five headache medications, including either Oxycontin or methadone. And on what my doctor used to call the really bad days, and I didn't leave the house, but she gave me injectable Demerol. So I had like 10 vials of Demerol in my house, along with Valium and mood regulator and Wellbutrin and, you know. We've been good friends. (laughs) But nothing was working. See, that's the thing. Nothing was working uh, for me. And I still had this horrific headache pain. So in January of 2000, I had two serious car accidents. One of them was swerving across Route 70 five times and crashing into the guardrail. And I just ignored that one. You know, I just went home and pretended that it didn't happen. I wasn't hurt. The car was a little hurt, but I could make up a story about that. And then a few weeks later, I was driving through Baltimore on my way to go visit my parents. And I, it was a really warm January afternoon. The car was filled with sunshine and it was about two o'clock. And um, I had to slow down and stop at a stoplight. And the next thing I know, I woke up with an airbag in my chest and smoke filling my car and a, a man in black pounding on my window. And I rolled down the window and I looked at him and I said, I'm so drugged. And he said, I don't know where that came from because I didn't talk like that, but that's what came out. And he said, lady, don't ever say that again. And he helped me to get off the road and he waited with me until my dad came. And, you know, I'm rooting in my car for the insurance information to give this man so that he can, I don't know what, his van was fine. And he he disappeared. He was gone. I really believe he was an angel. I believe in angels. You know, there was a That's for another day. He might have been yeah. he might add a warrant. I mean, just a more logical <laughs> answer. It was me and I was wanted. Oh, okay. I had okay. stolen the van before you did okay. it anyway. So. So, so but anyway, in in to you in he was either the, way. In the way that those things go, it was the beginning of my recovery. And how you and I, one more example, I'm sure, of how you and I can relate to people inside when we have those. I can't tell you how many experiences I have where I'm like, that should have been a 10 year prison sentence and a bigger one if somebody would have been really hurt. How did I not kill somebody? And then I just kept going in life. But those moments don't some of that's why a lot of my students and our students are in prison. That's, you know, I have thought back on that and thought back on that, like if I had injured someone. I would be responsible because I was the driver of the car. I don't know that it would matter that I was on all those drugs. My doctors never said, don't drive. They never said, you can't take methadone and Valium together. It will depress your respiration. You can pass out. They never said that. That's so weird. Not weird, but it's not right. It's, it's, in my mind, it's criminal. It really is. So when I went home, I called an energy healer. I had, I have friends that are very spiritual. We had a prayer group together. And one of them said, you know, she's great. She really helped me. And I called her and told her the story. And she said, well, I can almost guarantee that I can get rid of your pain, but I don't know what else is going to happen. Are you ready? And I said, yeah, I'm ready. And I worked with her for four months. I would just call her up, tell her how she would ask me a bunch of questions. How are you doing? How's this going? How's that going? And then I would go lie in my bed, 
close my eyes and she would uh, clear my chakras fine. Yeah, I honestly didn't. If we had more time, I'd probably dig into it now because you brought it up. I didn't know what to make of this. And at the end, I almost <laughs> thought, I wonder if she included that on purpose to point out one of the main points of the book, which is to say, the story you've been told about something is not necessarily true, but your history in who you are, like sometimes things work that are bananas and we're like, what are you talking about? And sometimes things you've been told are work aren't going to work. And sometimes we reach an age where we move on, but we don't know how to describe it. So we need something. Right. Um, I just, I wasn't sure what to do with it because the rest of the book felt like you were really evidence-based in the <laughs> faith healing. I don't know if you're familiar with Darren Brown. I was digging for the name in my right. psyche, but he does. he's done, among other Netflix specials where he messes with human consciousness, he's done mm -hmm. faith healing uh, events where he, unlike Marjo, who's another one, Mary mixed with Joseph, you can look mm -hmm. up on YouTube, who was raised in an evangelical family and then moved away from the church, but went on a televised mission that was publicized as a documentary to trick people into thinking he was faith healing. Darren Brown doesn't add the religion. So Marjo went up on stage and got him going. Darren Brown heals people though, and he'll get calls 20 years later from conventions where he starts out by saying, I'm not faith healing. I'm not calling on God. I'm not using angels, but I'm going to follow the same techniques and talk in the same way that people who have been doing this for thousands of years and evolving alongside humans have been doing. And it works. And if you put people in a sugar pill study and tell them it's a sugar pill, 25 to 50% of them will, at the end of the study, have improvements in something and want to keep taking the pill. Yes. And I didn't know yes. if, I mean, regardless, that's what humans are, right? I just wasn't really sure what to do with the faith, he well, faith I, healing. I'm calling whenever, it something I different. considered it energy healing. And yeah. when at that time, 22 years ago, I had no, I didn't even know what a chakra was. You know, I, I didn't understand that we were, as they say, as the energy healers say, beings of light, that we have energetic fields that surround us, that we put out. Now, when you think about it, we do. We do put out energy. You know that there are some people that you don't like to be with. And you'll, you'll say, well, you know, she, he has really negative energy. I, I don't know what it yeah, is. Yeah, I start there and keep yeah. going. And then I pinpoint, oh, he's got a, a squinted eye that I read as aggressive. And I usually walk away a better person for being like, oh, crap, I have these. Or he was traumatized as a kid, so he talks with a gruff voice. Like all the little things that can just make you feel a certain way. But it's so hard to really explain that it's often well, I, easier to just be like, but the, the energy, I'm not saying it's not real. I'm so evidence-based that I'm always like, tell me about the energies. And there's just I, no way. You have to just like, take them. You have to just accept that there's you, something to it and it works. There, there is, because she helped me get off of methadone. And be able to stop. I was injecting myself a few times a day with some kind of headache drug. I think it was called DHE. And I was using these nasal sprays. And I still had the Demerol. And she helped me get off of all those drugs. And the pain gradually dissipated. And at some point, she said, I want you to take flower essences. Now, that was even more of a jump than the energy healing. I don't know why, but I'd I go the other way. At least there's a substance you can research there and be like, oh, did you ever look up what the, I, it wasn't in the book, but did you look up no. what was in it? Because chances no, are. Not at the time. You know, it was 2000. It was kind of the beginning, more the beginning of the internet. It wasn't, mm. I wasn't as hooked into the internet as I am now, yeah. but I, I thought she wants me to take flower essences and I've been taking methadone. This is crazy, but Whatever she was doing was working and nothing else had worked. And, you know, within that's all that matters to me. Yes. Unless within she's, you want to know why I'm really upset right now? See, this is what I mean by think again, maybe <laughs> squinting a little more. I have a close family member right now who is paying a hundred dollars a scan to have their, their energy scanned anywhere on earth by somebody who doesn't use any equipment who claims to be able to rid them of viruses for a hundred bucks. And it's the same language, but clearly it's somebody who's picked up probably some very legitimate evidence-based stuff. And even some of what, whether there's evidence there or not, it works for some st substantial amount of people. Your story is not unique. Well, you know, it, it's unique, but not in the regards of chakra energy healing work. There's right. limitless people out there that have had the same experience. I'm just the guy that's like, well, if the sugar pill works too, and if Darren Brown works too, 
it turns out we're not as simple creatures as we all want to pretend. We're so yeah. complicated and there's so much going on behind the scenes that sometimes we're ready to change and we just need freaking something to be the, the thing. That's the right. guy on stage that healed my knee and now I walk different for a few weeks and what do you know? I feel better. Or my depression's lifted or, and whether it's that it's, there's no evidence there at all, or that's pure evidence and it worked for you. It doesn't matter if it worked for you. Awesome. Right. right? I don't understand it. All I can say is it's been 22 years. And if I get a headache, it's, it lasts for a few days hmm. and I can take care of it myself. So to come back to the Kava Kava, cause yeah. I, I want to close that circle. A few years ago, I started having horrible anxiety driving on the highway. Hmm. And I kept saying to myself, you know, this doesn't make any sense. You've never lost control of your car. And I said that for a few years and struggled with this anxiety. And then one, one time I was in the mountains with my daughter and I could, could hardly drive. I was white knuckling the steering wheel and she, That's was, normal. <laughs> she was sleeping. And I thought, okay, I have to drive for an hour because she said she was really tired. So I have to drive for an hour and then I'm going to wake her up. And when I came home, I, I said, again, I, I've never lost control of my car. And this little voice inside said, yes, you have. Hmm. Yes. And then I remembered the two car accidents and I connected it. I, the, eyes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> the person who furrows their brow or has a deep voice. Yeah, it's deep. Right. I, I connected it. Like, yeah. And what I started to think about is that I never felt the fear from those car accidents because I was so drugged. Hmm. I couldn't feel anything. So it didn't scare me. Drive, I got right back in the car and drove completely numb. And I thought, okay, well, it took 20 years, 20 years or whatever to Dig come it back. Up. And how am I going to manage this? So I did go to a therapist and I did some eye movement, rapid eye movement desensitization. And that got me to about 85 or 90% feeling okay. But I still use some kava kava because I figure it, maybe it's doing something. I don't know. Um, <laughs> I'm sure and it I is. Use and some rescue remedy. Even I the mean, the eye movement stuff is bizarre. The research on that, it's hard. It's one more thing that, like the the chakras. Somebody is. might show it what it is in another 10, 20 years, and then I'll have to be like, oh, now I understand. We couldn't understand that. But the eye movement doesn't make a lick of sense to me, and it works. My wife shared some of the research on it and she's had it done before too so it's we're we're weird creatures us humans you know your book stretches me in some ways because i'm i'm more opposed to psychiatric drugs than i am a, for them i've had to learn so much about the dangers of them and i've seen for myself that they never worked but i've had to moderate to come to the to be credible also and to be able to say if you want to take the drugs, take the drugs. And we all deserve informed consent. And this is what informed consent means. You need yeah. to know what the alternatives are, what the pros are of this drug, what the negatives are, and how are you going to get off of it? And I also agree we should be looking back a little bit to more natural alternatives that are outlawed if you're going to use, because these are all just replacements and none of them have worked. Nothing the pharmaceutical industry has made in the last hundred years including heroin, which was originally sold to cure morphine addiction, has lived up to the promises that were made about it before it hit the market. Nothing, not one drug. That doesn't mean you shouldn't take them at times, but I'm of the mindset that whatever it is you're pouring into you, if you find that it's disrupting your quality of life this much, one little bit, that's the moment you need to say, uh oh, it might disrupt it more in the future. Whatever I'm using it for, where's another source of that thing? Mm -hmm. If you got trauma going on, if you got pain going on, of course, when we run into a drug that mimics the fulfillment of publishing 13 books in one day and getting a publisher or getting the biggest prize in the country for all of them, and all we got to do is sniff a little up our nose, we want to go back and do that drug again if we're somebody that's lacking that sort of feeling. And another drug that makes us feel like we can go do anything and it's fun and we're usually stuck in our house, yeah, that drug could be a problem. Recognize See, that's, that's why that's another reason they said that I was bipolar because. When the Hopkins doctor told me I was bipolar, I said to him, this is the people's normal happiness level. This is the average person. Yeah. I said, my level is here. 
This is who I am. So I'm happier than most people. Yeah. And yeah. I have more energy than most people. And boy, I mean, I'm sure that he thought I was really crazy. When I he said, 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 you're not being one size fits all. And we don't have a pill. Oh, we do have a pill to make you one size fits all. Yeah. We're not right. one size fits all. So. Right. Cool. I appreciate you taking the time to do this. Thanks very much. I appreciate it. That was Ann Bracken. And you can find her books, Crash and Once You're Inside, online at Robot Overlord Amazon or wherever you buy books. Thanks for listening. Love yourselves and the addicted people in your life. I'm Ben Boyce. If you're still here, you might want more. So consider checking out my book, Dr. Junkie, One Man's Story of Addiction and Crime that will challenge everything you know about the war on drugs. You can get it wherever you buy books. If you want to know what the world would look like if drugs were legal, or why we develop tolerance and sensitization to drugs when we take them for extended periods, or if you just want to know why I went to prison, check out the book. 